Before we begin, I do want to read a land acknowledgement. We recognize that Kaufman Museum stands on the prairie where many original peoples hunted and farmed before the arrival of European and American settlers, particularly the Wichita, the Kaw, and the Osage. As you visit Kaufman Museum's exhibits and outdoor spaces, we ask that you honor the contributions Native Americans have made to our nation's heritage and commit, and that you commit to respecting their descendants and learning about their rich cultural traditions. I also want to share uh, just a couple things before we get to the meatier part of our program, and that is I hope you've had a chance to see the reeds and wool exhibit, which is uh, <coughs> just behind all of you over there in our special exhibitions area. And that went up. The final pieces were uh, put up yesterday, and that will be up through May 21. So we hope you'll have a chance to go see the reeds and wool exhibit. <coughs> We have two speakers this evening. I'd like to introduce Janine Waddle, and Dr. Waddle is enthusiastic. <laughs> Only her academic prowess in the field of social political anthropology and her determination to connect, to connect people might outweigh her enthusiasm. <laughs> Janine initiated the connections between our special guests this weekend, Ina Navazaleski from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and Justina, our primary speaker this evening. Janine grew up in North Newton, Kansas on the Bethel College campus. After attending Bethel College, Janine went on to earn graduate degrees in anthropology with a focus on East European studies at Indiana University and the University of California at Berkeley. She is the winner of multiple <coughs> awards and the author of numerous books. Janine is a university professor in the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, Arlington, Virginia. <coughs> Justina Neufeld lives in North Newton. She is the author of two books, A Family Torn Apart and Use Does Escape. Justina spent her early years living in Soviet Ukraine with her parents and siblings. At the age of 13, she began an immigration journey that led, to her po led her to Poland, France, Holland, Minnesota, Bethel College, and eventually her permanent home in the Newton area. Justina worked for most of her professional career as a nurse and administrator at Prairie View Psychiatric Hospital in Newton. Justina can be a private person, and she is fiercely loyal to family and friends. Yet she is willing to profoundly, be profoundly vulnerable by telling the story of her life to others. Please help me welcome Justina and Janine. Okay. Well, good evening. Welcome. I am honored to be part of um, today's events featuring Ina Navazelskis, who's our uh, guest tonight, who spoke earlier in Crable Auditorium. She's from the uh, Holocaust Museum, and she interviewed Justina um, for about nine hours, and it's on the website of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And, of course, the second event of today, which is a conversation with Justina, uh, our conversation with, with Justina. So to channel William Faulkner, the past is never dead, and it's not even past. <laughs> and, to de and indeed, that's never seemed more the case than it is today with Justina's lived World War II experience and the present brutal war in Ukraine. Few people are better equipped to speak to that lived experience and these parallels than Justina. Justina, you were born in 1930, the youngest of 10 children. 
You were born just in time for what the Ukrainians call the Holodomor, mass hunger resulting from Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture. That genocide was directed toward Soviet Ukraine and resulted in an estimated four to seven million deaths. You've said that you survived the Holodomor only because of mother's milk. At age 10, your father was arrested by the Soviet NKVD, the forerunner of the KGB, and your mother sent you to find out why he didn't return from work the previous evening. And you write in your second book, Justa, that's Justina's nickname from childhood, Justa's Escape. And this book is directed, um, directed towards adolescence, so it's from a, a young audience. And it's written in poetry. And you write about that episode. I walked behind the houses to the collective farm's dairy barn where Papa had his office. I entered the barn with its rows of tied up munching cows waiting to be milked. Something felt wrong. My chest tightened, my breath became short. Your Papa? Go tell your mama they took him away last night, the NKVD, the secret police. With that, I ran from the barn. I tried to shout, to scream, but no sound came out. This message lay like lead inside of me. Too much for a little girl. How could I tell mama such news? Your father perished like countless others of the era um, in Stalinist purges, likely shot in the back of the neck, um, as, as was customary at the time. And I think back to 1988, I spent many years in communist Poland in the 1980s, and I remember when it was finally safe to talk openly about those relatives and acquaintances that you had who had perished somewhere in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union under Soviet occupation. And people, this is under um, uh, glasnost emanating from Gorbachev's Soviet Union in the, late, in the late 80s. And I remember people like my my landlady glued to the newspapers that were coming out that had lists of names of people who had perished under Soviet occupation 45 years earlier. And they were looking to find, was there anything about um, Uncle Henrik? Was there anything about Grandpa Anje that we can learn about their actual fate? We know they never returned. And Justina, you never saw your father again, and you also never learned the specifics of this, uh, of, of what happened to him. In 1941, in the summer, the Germans invaded Ukraine, Soviet, Soviet Ukraine. Your oldest five brothers were already out of the house. Two years later, in more than two years later, in 1943, the Germans were losing the war and began their retreat. Your family does not want to live again under Soviet rule that, that is soon to, be, soon to be reimposed. So your three youngest brothers hitch up the wagons and leave with you, your sister, your mother, and your aunt as the Germans retreat westward. Your first stop is 45 kilometers away from your um, hometown, Kriva Rig. Um, and just this morning, you were telling me that you heard about Kriva Rig yesterday on the radio. Yeah. What did you hear? It's the first time that I heard the name mentioned in the news because, and I don't know why, but um, um, they mentioned it because the infrastructure had been bombed and destroyed. It is um, an industrial city, and the point was to um, 
destroy this infrastructure so that the people, the Ukrainian people, would freeze this winter. That's what I heard. And about 30% of the power stations in Ukraine are now out of commission um, due to, to targeted bombing of the electricity grid of the of power sources and water is, 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 of course, also being targeted. Does this sound a bit like deja vu for you? Can you? What's the next question? <laughs> well, so Tom, <laughs> so any question you want to answer? Actually. Well, <laughs> it, it brought back a memory. Um, the very first day that we were leaving our village, um, our wagons were lined up to go west. Of course, we didn't know where we were going. They were lined up to go west, away from the front. And we were strafed. And our leader of the village yelled on his bullhorn into the ditches, into the ditches. And um, as we lay in the ditches, I remember thinking, this is my last hour. We heard the bullets whizzing over our heads. But finally, it quieted down, and um, our leader drove up and down the road to um, get us started. Well, some of our horses were spooked, and they had left the road, and we had to go and find them first in the field. Also, the herd of cattle that had been driven along with us was scattered, and we never recovered them. That's the flashback I had yesterday. And then we, after our horses were brought back to our wagons and so on, with the wagons, we drove and the, the order was drive as fast as you can, drive as fast as you can. We made it to Krivayri and then couldn't go any further because the roads were clogged with military vehicles and we had to stop there. And that's where we spent the first night under our wagons, seeing the city in flames because both of the armies, the German and the Russian army, were fighting over the city, one on the east and one on the west. And uh, we, we had to spend the night there outside the city. That's what came to mind. And your journey also took you further westward around the city of Vinitsa. And we had a visiting scholar who, um, from in, at my university in Washington, D.C., who came to Kansas last summer, and he met Justina, and uh, toured the Coffin Museum, met Andy, and a few other people in the community, including some who might be here tonight, um, who work with, with MCC. Um, and Anton's family is from eastern Ukraine, from, from the uh, um, Donetsk. Donetsk area originally, and they were, they were outside of occupied territories, just a bit outside of occupied territory, a territory that was taken over by Russian proxies in 2014. And when the war started, he worked to move them west to western, western part of Poland to the town of Vinitsa, where, which you also went through. And then a week after he successfully moved his parents to Vinitsa and got them apartment and worked everything out, Vinitsa was bombed and his father was not very far from where the bombing took place and saw a little girl being killed in that, in that bombing. So no place is safe. There was one other memory you mentioned this morning about sleeping in a barn. Oh, yes. Well, we traveled um, as fast as we could. It's the first two weeks, um, the weather was fine. And then it started, this was in October of 43. And then it started to rain and sleet. And the horses had trouble traveling on icy roads. Uh, people got sick and died, and um, what was I going to 
You're saying you were sleeping in the barn at okay. night. Yeah. We, during that uh, bad weather, we would always look for uh, um, a collect the farm barn to, uh, to spend the night. And that uh, one night, it was um, very, very full. And we were very, very tired. And all of a sudden, I hear a scream, a terrible scream. It came from my mother. And uh, I was uh, startled and awakened. And here, um, a man who had also come to sleep there on top of somebody else threw his muddy, heavy leather boot across and, and hit my mother in the face. And that was a <laughs> terrible scream that I remember from one night. And your trek took you, like many people in uh, Ukraine today, took you, after three months in your case, you ended up in relative safety at the time in a, in a town near Warsaw in Poland called Zdunska Wola. Um, so that, that became a refugee center. It had been an old flour mill, and 350 of us homeless people were put up in this uh, flour mill. And today, there are an estimated 9 to 11 million refugees that have left Ukraine, and the majority are, uh, have gone to to, to Warsaw, more than half of the refugees, are, sorry, not to Warsaw, but to, but to Poland, um, are in, in Poland. And I happened to be in Warsaw this summer, and I met with a um, friend from Odessa, which is not so w where many, Odessa is on the southern, um, a southern port city in Ukraine, and some of your brothers went to university in Odessa. It's not so very far from where you grew up. Anyway, this lady grew up um, in an orphanage, and but managed to get herself a university education, came back as a teacher to orphanage kids, and um, was entrusted by the Ukrainian government when the war broke out to take busloads of kids out of out of Ukraine to Warsaw and other parts of Poland, and then so she would take them out and then she'd go back. Of course, Odessa is being strafed constantly by, by Russians. Um, and then she'd take another busload out. And so she has been doing this all summer and getting kids out of the country. And she told me when I met with her, and she brought a 16-year-old um, girl with her that she wanted me, wanted to get, me to get acquainted with. She said, the next busload that I bring out is going to be kids who are new orphans. That is, they lost their parents in the war. And so, Justina, you were, like these kids, you were a refugee. When you came here, you were 17 years old. You had all of this lived experience. Um, and here you were encountering other kids in a small, isolated, community. So what can we learn from your lived experience, the lived experience of terrible loss? Your father was executed. Two brothers that were conscripted into the German army perished. Your remaining family was displaced. You never saw your mother again. What can we learn from this experience? What was it like when you came to this country at the age of 17 as, as a refugee? I think everybody's tired and wants to go home. <laughs> well, um, I was very fortunate in that I uh, had sponsors in Minnesota who wanted to adopt me. And, uh, but um, just before the papers came through to come to Minnesota, I learned that uh, my mother was still alive. She was in, in the far north, so I was not adoptable. But they were very kind, and they uh, met all my physical needs. I had food and clothing. I had a room to myself. 
They lived on the farm. They were an old couple. I had never lived with just two people, two old people <laughs> on a farm. <laughs> the village was my playground, and even in the refugee camp, I, we had fun. But this was a new, a new thing. And um, so my physical needs were met, but inside my inner life was in chaos. How could I come to grips? With the fact that I had so much and more than I needed and my mother was starving because her first letter that she wrote to her brothers in Canada and that we, through whom we heard that she was alive, stated that my tante, uh, my grandmother's sister, who had lived with me or with our family all my life, that she had starved within a couple of months after arriving in Siberia. How could I come to grips with that? So, anyway, life was, I, I arrived November 1, and um, I had expressed the wish that I could go to school. I hadn't been in school for four years, the refugee years. I had only had a three-grade education, and um, this elderly couple was very much in favor of me going to school. Um, so, but between November 1 and Christmas, we, um, I was taken to, to meet other old couples. <laughs> <laughs> Retired people, you know. The kids were in school, but uh, all the relatives and everyone was very eager to hear because I was the first refugee to arrive. And so everybody wanted to hear my story. And I told it over and over <laughs> and over again. And uh, finally, um, January arrived and I could start going to school. I was, uh, they had made arrangements for me to um, live with the family in town so that I could go to school uh, from town. And this family had four children and they didn't speak German. So it was good for me. And I think one of them is here in the audience. Lenore, are you here? Lenore Walter? She was the oldest. There That's she here. is. Yeah. That was a perfect uh, environment for me to get a start and become acculturated. I mean, I'm, there was so much to learn. I um, was tested out and they put me in the seventh grade and uh, assigned two girls to me who spoke low German. And they would help me with my assignments and so on. And one of them, a lot of you would know, is Jean Jansen, the poet. She spoke low German and she um, um, helped me. Anyway, in um, two and a half years, I graduated from high school. And um, all that time, I was trying to become an American. I know Lenore's family. One of them, Louise, begged me to come to a ball game. And finally, I acquiesced and went to a, a basketball game. I couldn't understand why people yelled and why, <laughs> why even old people would jump up and, and raise their arms and scream and yell just because somebody was running around on, on the... <laughs> it, it seemed so insane. <laughs> and I, I stopped going to ball games. I, I rather wanted to stay home and be with Barbara, who was the youngest, six months old. So anyway, I had um, some really good experiences. But... Um, One thing, my family did not show affection or was not demonstrative and 
saying I love you and so on. And the family that I came to live with were, were the same way, staunch Prussians. <laughs> and um, so um, feelings were not expressed. I lived with my inner life alone and many times just wet the pillow at night and didn't talk to anybody. Couldn't talk to anybody about what life was like for me. It was just very hard. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, so your first book is called A Family Torn Apart. And just a few days ago, I came across an article about present day Ukraine with the same title, Family Torn Apart. And so I was going to ask you two more questions. <laughs> and one is, how do you move on and construct a life after all of these losses and trauma? And what's the other one? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I want to skip one. <laughs> no. Well, I can, whatever okay, you want to do. Well, so, so, you know, the refugee experience can easily seem, we might know a few refugees, we might even be involved in projects to help refugees in our communities or elsewhere, but it still seems to most of us with our nice homes and comfortable lives and everything set up as an experience that is out there, it, it happens to somebody else, it doesn't really affect us, it's not really about us. And so, how do you move on? Well, well okay. <laughs> it, that implies that you have a road map. It implies that you have a plan. I did have a plan. My plan was to work to earn money so that I could send care packages to my mother and that I could go into nurses training. I had worked during the summer in a hospital as a nurse's aide, and I knew since age 10 or earlier that I wanted to be a nurse because my mother was sick with malaria in the summer time, and I was the one to bring her water. And uh, uh, she became delirious at one point and would say things that I didn't understand and couldn't handle, and I thought, if I learn how to take care of sick people, I won't be afraid. And I wanted to, to be a nurse so I would know how to take care of sick, sick people. And uh, so when I came here, I had a plan that uh, I would, go into, would take nurses training so that I wouldn't be afraid of sick people. And so, so I moved on from one thing to another. And so how do we as a community, so it, it, this, again, this experience can seem very far away to us because most of us don't have your experience. Mm -hmm. And what, what can we learn from this history and can this happen here? Can this happen here? Um, that reminds me of Kristallnacht, 1938, when Jewish businessmen in Germany and in Austria, I believe, their businesses, their windows of businesses were smashed. It's called Kristallnacht because the glass in the streets sparkled and looked like crystal. I have read some uh, survivors' journals where they say we did not anticipate, we didn't know this was coming. I know there were some that knew and left Germany, but many stayed because they did not believe that anything like this could happen because Germany was a civilized country. This couldn't happen here. Well, it did. 
The other thing that comes to mind is the Crimea. Just in uh, 2014, I have a friend, Svetlana, who is from Belarus, who lives here now, who says, no, she says, the average person would never have predicted that Russia would take the, uh, the Crimea. We would never have believed that if anybody had told us. But it did happen. Fast forward. January 6, 2021. I will never forget. I sat in my living room knitting. The sun was shining brightly. Suddenly I decided to turn on the TV. And I thought I was seeing a horror movie. I thought, what is this violence? Until I heard a familiar announcer coming on and telling me that this was happening right now. And I was so shocked. I screamed to myself, no, 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 when I heard the shattering of the glass. It was just so powerful. The insurrection in Washington, D.C., of course. Who here could have predicted that? I would have said never. This can never happen in the United States, but it did. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Janine, and thank you so much, Justina. Um, we are grateful that you're willing to be here tonight and grateful that you're willing to share with us. Um, and thank you all for coming, and we wish you a good night and safe travels. Um, before I let you go, I do have coworkers reminding me that we do have Justina's books for sale in our bookstore. We don't have enough copies for a room full like this, but we do have a, a list where we can keep track. So uh, be well and travel safely. <laughs>